every dairy farmer has in common is that everybody has calves to deal with when it comes to the springtime. Uh, and obviously there's some changing regulations around calves every couple of years. And the most recent one is the ICOS charter, which is, uh, has been put out there in the press in the last couple of weeks in relation to the slaughter calves, that that's going to be banned from the 1st of January 2024. So people are going to have to make adjustments maybe in, in line, light of that for, in some cases where it doesn't necessarily affect everybody. Uh, and so Emer Kennedy, who you'll be all very familiar with, Emer's a senior research officer in Chagas and Moor Park. And Emer's, one of Emer's focus areas is calf rearing. And Emer's going to talk to you about the elements that you need to put in place for rearing good, healthy calves, irrespective of the system that you're operating in. So Emer, I'll call on you to give your presentation, please. Good afternoon, um, everybody. So this afternoon, I'm going to talk to you about the management and housing guidelines to achieve excellent calf welfare. And firstly, I'd like to acknowledge my co-author in the paper, Alison Sinnott. So calf welfare, it's a very emotive issue and one that's to the forefront internationally. But how do we fare in Ireland? This morning in the first session, we heard an awful lot about consumers and what consumers want. This also extends in terms of animal welfare and calf welfare. So consumers are becoming more interested in animal welfare, in particular their living conditions. They would also like more information on farming practices and how welfare friendly they are. And consumers are also starting to have heightened concerns towards animal welfare with increased scale. So we need to ensure that we have a high standard of animal welfare on farms, in particular calf welfare. In a recent survey by Sharon Sweeney, where she interviewed or surveyed almost a thousand people, she asked them what their perception towards animal welfare was in terms of dairying. And what she found was that over 70% of the respondents thought that animal welfare was either good or very good. And then when she asked them how it changed over the last 10 years, over 60% felt that it improved. So Irish farmers currently have a really good reputation in terms of animal welfare. So it is now more important than ever that this is retained. Recently, we did a survey where we asked farmers how do they rate themselves. And our survey population was across 51 farms in Munster. The average herd size was 254, with the herd size ranging from 87 to 550 cows. 96% of the herds were solely spring calving, and their calving season length ranged from 8 to 14 and a half weeks. <clears throat> so we firstly asked them how do they rate their own calf welfare on their farms. And over 80% said that calf welfare on their farm was either very good or extremely good. And then when we asked them to rate their husbandry skills, over 85% rated their husbandry skills as either very good or extremely good. However, there is always room to improve. And I guess one of the big indications that we have in terms of um, welfare is calf mortality or perinatal calf mortality. And again, we fare quite well. If we look at countries such as the US and Germany, the rate is about 8%, whereas in Ireland it's less than 5 but we're targeting a mortality rate of less than 4%. So when we talk about excellent calf welfare, what we're really talking about is good nutrition, appropriate housing, excellent husbandry skills, and a high health status of the herd. So to address the nutrition side of things, we've come up with the calf 1 to 6 rule. So this incorporates the colostrum 1 to 3 rule. So firstly, one is for the first milking, so calves should only be fed the first milk that the cow produces because this is the only one that's going to have enough antibodies um, to feed the calf and kickstart its immune system. And the only way that we know if that colostrum is of high enough quality is if we test it using a refractometer such as the one here, where we place a few drops in it, look through the eyepiece, and you'll see a scale like the one that we have there on the right, and once that's over 22%, that says that there's enough antibodies in that to, for the calf for its first feed. So once we're sure we're feeding high enough quality colostrum, we need to feed it within two hours of birth. Because from the graph here, you can see that the maximum antibodies are absorbed from that colostrum within the first two hours after birth. And then the calf's ability to absorb the uh, antibodies drops really fast, and by 24 hours of age, the calf can no longer absorb any more antibodies. And when we're feeding the colostrum, we want to feed at least three litres of that high quality colostrum to the calf. So once we have our colostrum feeding sorted, we then move on to transition milk. 
which is milkings two to six produced by the cow. We want to feed at least four feeds of transition milk. And from studies that we've done, we have found that this um, shows up in calves with less poor health signs, so they have less runny ears, or sorry, runny nose, runny eyes, and droopy ears. And also remember that if you're vaccinating for rotor and corona um, virus, you need to feed that transition milk in order to get the maximum out of that vaccine. So with that transition milk, you need to be feeding at least five litres a day, over two feeds across the day. And once we have the transition milk sorted, we then want to move on to feeding either whole milk, so high quality whole milk, which is not waste milk, or milk, good quality milk replacer, and feeding six litres of that. A good quality milk replacer is 23 to 26% crude protein, 16 to 20% fat or oil, and a fibre and an ash content of less than 0.15 and the ash less than 8.5. If the figures for the fibre and the ash are getting close to what's there, it's generally indicative of a poor quality product and one that can cause more digestive upsets. The reason we're talking about good nutrition in the early few days, particularly the colostrum management, is if we look at this graph here, you can see that when we feed the calf, it's colostrum. We, like we all know that the calf is born without a developed immune system. So when we feed it, it's colostrum, we're kick-starting that immune system. And those antibodies are giving us a peak in passive immunity at 24 hours after the first feed. And that, that immunity starts to wane then. But at the same time, the calf's own immunity is starting to develop. But in between that time when the immunity from the colostrum is decreasing and the calf's own immunity is building, is a very high risk period. And you can see that's occurring within the first two to three weeks of life. And this is a period of high risk when the calf is much more susceptible um, to getting sick. So during this time, we should avoid moving and mixing calves as it is a very high risk period. So once we've got um, our milk and our transition milk and um, all our liquid feed sorted, we also need to look at rumen development. So all calves should be offered water and concentrate from the start, so from birth. At birth, the calf's digestive system is underdeveloped. It's basically acting as a simple stomach or monogastric animal for the first two weeks. The abomasum is the only stomach compartment that's actively involved in digestion at that time and it's utilizing nutrients just from the milk um, or milk replacer. And that is why it's so important to feed the calf at least twice a day for the first um, few weeks of life. Then as the calf begins to eat dry feeds, particularly concentrate, which contains readily fermentable carbohydrates, the rumen takes on a more important role. And the stomach compartments grow and change as the calf develops into a ruminant animal. And calves that have free access to water tend to eat more concentrate and have greater rumen development. And this is all vitally important for the post-weaning period. Because really, what we're trying to do by feeding them concentrate from such an early age is that we're trying to develop the rumen, but also prepare them for a solid feed diet and try to minimise that post-weaning check um, after they're weaned off milk. So when we move on to weaning, weaning must be gradual. So this means that you're reducing the milk volume over a period of seven to 10 days. Anything less than that is considered abrupt weaning and you will get a higher post weaning check afterwards and set the calves backwards. At weaning, we need to ensure the calves are eating at least one kilo of concentrate before they're weaned. For example, the calves in Park will be eating at least two kilos of concentrate before they're weaned. So we know that they're, they're ready and um, well ready to be weaned and transitioned onto a solid diet. And just to give you like a quick kind of rule of thumb, if you have a pen of 10 calves at weaning, they should be eating a bag of concentrate every two days. Some of the work that we have done um, recently has shown that if we introduce grass into the pre-weaning diet, it can help with that post-weaning transition in that you get less of a post-weaning check because the calves rumen is adjusting to grass as a feed. So then when they're taken off milk, they, they know how to digest the grass properly and they can just um, carry on in terms of their weight gain. It's always a good idea that if you have small calves that you retain them on milk for, for longer, as the feed conversion efficiency is greater when on milk, and you can then wean them at a later stage so that you have a more uniform group of calves um, to rear uh, during the main grazing season in the summer. Okay, so we'll move on now to calf housing. And one of the most important things with calf housing is hygiene and having really um, good hygiene practices. So if we think of the calf when it's in utero, there's no transfer of immunoglobulins between the cow and the calf. 
So unlike a human baby, when we're born, we have a functioning immune system. With the calf, the placenta is separating the maternal and the fetal blood supplies. So when the calf is born, it's almost entirely dependent on the absorption of maternal immunoglobulins from the, or antibodies from the colostrum. So you can imagine if you had a newborn baby, there's no way you would dream of putting it into a dirty environment. Similarly, if a calf with no developed immune system is born into a dirty environment such as the pictures here, of course it's at greater risk of contracting and picking up diseases. So this is a big word of warning to, to keep your um, maternity pens and your calving pens as clean as possible. And we want to move to a situation like in this picture where we have a nice clean um, bed of dry straw for the calves to be born. So the next question then is, how much space does a calf need? So the legal minimum space requirement is 1.5 metres squared um, per calf, less than 150 kilos. So basically a pre-weaned calf. Now obviously, the more space that you can afford to give the calf, the better. But if we're talking about in terms of spring uh, 2023, there's limited time to get yourselves ready between now and then. So we're going to work on 1.5 metres squared for today. In the survey that we did, 90% of the calf houses had enough capacity, and this was back in 2020, and when all the calves could, could be sold um, off the farm. And e even in that, 85% of the farms had expanded, they still had enough capacity. Our survey did show, however, that where calves had more space, there was less health issues, and they were freer to um, express their, their behaviour. But the question then arises, if calves have to stay on farm for longer, will there be enough space for them? And the other thing to consider is what kind of group size that you're going to, to put the calves in. Smaller group sizes tend to have less disease spread. And in the survey um, of the Munster farms, what we found was that over 75% of the farmers kept their calves in groups of less than 12. So this is just a spreadsheet that Joe Patton um, did. So we're just going to go through it. And it's basically looking at the effect of calving spread and the age at sale on calf space requirement. So we're taking 150 cow herd with a 25% replacement rate. So in this first example, 85% of the cows are calving within six weeks, and then they're being sold at three to four weeks of age. So here we need a minimum space requirement of 156 meters squared. And that's enough for a peak of 92 calves, or 61% um, of the, the calves to be born. If we look at selling the calves at an older age, such as at eight weeks of age, you can see that the space requirement dramatically increases. And our total calves at peak are 140, which is pretty close to the total number of calves which are going to be born um, on the farm. So delaying the age at sale from three to eight weeks increases the space requirement by about 50%. If we now look at what effect um, a, a different calving spread has, so having 75% calves within six weeks, and again selling at three weeks, we can see the space isn't really that different. Again, if the calves are sold at eight weeks, there's a big jump up in the space that's required. So if you're selling the calves basically at over six weeks of age, you need to have more or less enough space for 100% um, of your calves. So how are you going to measure your shed? How are you going to know if you have enough space? So if we take a shed that's got six equally sized pens, we're going to measure the length and the width um, of, the, of each pen. So in this case, it's six meters by three meters. Multiply those to get 18 meters squared and divide it by 1.5 meters squared which is the space length per calf. So that means there can be 12 calves in that pen. And if we multiply it by six, if we take that each of the pens are an equal size, that means that shed can house 72 calves. Now, there is always a need to ensure that there is enough air space in the shed as well um, as floor space. And the air capacity is seven meters cubed up to two months, 10 meters cubed after that. And this is calculated by multiplying the total shed length by the total shed width by the shed height. And if you want more information on, on housing, AHI have really good resource leaflets that will cover ventilation, drainage, the side walls, partitions, and positioning of the housing. A question that we are frequently asked in terms of labor is, you know, which is, which is more labor efficient? Is it an automatic or a manual feeding system? And what do calves do better on? So from experiments that we have done, we have found no difference um, in the performance of calves that were on either an automatic system or a manual feeding system when they were both fed the same amount of milk. Equally, there was no differences in their health or behavior. 
Where the differences arose was that there was a big difference in cost. So we had the, a big initial cost or outlay of the automatic feeders. There's also an, uh, um, an annual servicing cost with them. And like while some of the experiments, controlled experiments we have done, have shown a reduction in um, labour input, some of the work from on-farm uh, labour studies has shown that where an automatic milk feeder is in place, that farmers tended to leave the calves on milk for longer, and also they weren't allowed um, access. It's much harder, I guess, to give them access to, to grass. So the labour input actually increased, as did, as did the costs. So if you have um, an automatic feeder, yes, it can be more labour efficient, but you need to be very disciplined in how you use it. Okay, so um, at the end of last month, so at the end of um, November, we went to, to Mitchellstown to visit Liam Roach and we looked at how he was dealing with increased cow numbers and a compact calving pattern in terms of his calf management. So I'll just play the video there now. I'm Liam Roach, I'm in Mitchellstown. It was last year we calved 363 cows down. Our six week calving rate is 86%. Calf welfare would be high on the agenda here. Uh, we take great pride in the calves we rear here. We could have over 100 heifer calves from year to year. We have the same customers every single year coming back, buying our calves, so obviously they're happy with them. Calves will be well, well looked after the minute they're born. They get their three or four litres of bee stings, and um, they are nice. Uh, the second feed is another feed of bee stings. Their, their third feed then will be a feed of second milk, and then they'll be on milk from, a pooled milk from, from the cows. Um, by day three or four, we have them on the automatic feeder, and calves that have been sold are kept on milk until they're being sold. Our old calf house, it just needed, needed to be bigger. We came in here, we built um, an A-column shed, 50 foot wide, that'll handle about 240 calves at peak. Um, it's very labour efficient in terms of cleaning it out. We can bed them and clean them, we can turn it around in 20 to 30 minutes. So I suppose the importance of airflow here compared to our last shed, it, they were sharing the same airspace as cows and we, needed, we, knew, we knew that we needed to change that. So when we came in here, we put up a Yorkshire boarding at both sides. There's very good ventilation, very good airflow, good healthy calves, a good fresh house and that was the most important thing is what we needed. While we have, I suppose, plenty of airflow here, on a cold night we put um, sheets of insulation over the baby calves We'd have infrared lamps over newborn calves. We'd make sure that the calves are well bedded um, and plenty of straw around them and we, we don't spare the straw. The advice I'd give to other farmers building a new shed, just make sure it is clean, it is well ventilated, um, easy washed, e um, easy access for machinery to come in and out um, and just make sure that it is big enough to, to handle all calves at peak and probably even for longer going forward. We're in November now, we'll be getting ready for calving the calf feeder is serviced and ready. I suppose early days in January we'll rebed, we'll put down a new bit of straw under the calf house um, and have maybe a dozen individual pins ready. Okay, and I think one of the main things to take from that is how prepared the is for the forthcoming um, season. So in summary, it's really important that we retain our good animal welfare status. We have it at the moment, we don't want to lose it. If we implement good nutrition for our calves, so the calf one to six rule, if which is incorporating colostrum one, two, three, feeding transition milk, weaning them gradually, and making sure that we're getting the, the concentrate in for good room and development, um, that is a really good start. In terms of calf housing then, we want to make sure that our hygiene levels are really good, and also that we have the appropriate space for, for all the calves um, on the farm. And most importantly, we need to be prepared for the forthcoming season. So when you go home this evening, I want you to ask yourselves a few questions. Firstly, have you enough space and labour facilities for all your calves um, at peak? And if not, what are you going to do to rectify that? There's a couple of months now before we start calving, so you do have a little bit of time. In terms of your calf husbandry, how are you going to improve it? Um, does it need to be improved? Are you ready if there's a disease outbreak? Or how are you going to prevent a potential outbreak? And thirdly, how are you going to manage transitioning calves to their new homes? Have you identified buyers? Again, there's a bit of time before the calving season starts to do this. And also, are you going to keep many calves yourself? And if so, how many? And finally, what can you do to make your calves more desirable for potential buyers? Finally, I'd like to take this opportunity to wish you all a successful 2023 calving season. Thank you.
So just in the interest of time, I'll hold Emer questions for Emer until afterwards. Um, and Emer mentioned it there in the last slide, just in relation to um, the, what can you do and to the type of calf that you're going to have available for sale. So we've asked Alan Toomey to speak in, on that topic, and Alan has been involved in the development of the DBI in the last number of years. So Alan is going to talk to you about how DBI can have play a role for you on your farms in terms of maximizing the beef potential that's coming from the dairy herd. So I'll hand you over to Alan now for his presentation. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Stuart. Um, so just before I continue, I'd just like to also thanks the co-author, um, Ross Evans of ICBF. So firstly, well, I suppose we'll give a bit of a background to where we are on beef coming from the dairy herd. And there has been a lot of, I suppose, negativity in recent years about the carcass weight of these animals, the confirmation of these animals coming from the dairy herd and what their actual beef quality um, is coming from the dairy herd. And so that's brought a lot of research and interest from our side to look at this. And we looked at the genetic trend of, we'll say, our dairy herd over the last 10 years. And we can see that our dairy cows have declined in carcass weight genetically, although that's only five kilos over 10 years, but there, and also, they've declined in confirmation. And I know this is a dairy conference and a lot of people might know what confirmation is. That's the muscling of the animal and the value, of, the high value cuts in the animal. So that is reducing over the last 10 years due to our uh, breeding for um, dairy traits. And what this has actually led to is a lot of these dairy beef animals are falling out of carcass specifications. So specifications, or carcass specifications, are thresholds that the factories put on carcasses coming in, and there's big penalties if they fall out of these carcasses, or out of these uh, limits. So I'm just going to focus on two, and that's carcass weight, and just I broke it into two uh, segments, so that's beef and dairy, so when it's a beef sire, and then dairy and dairy when it's a dairy sire. And we see is there's almost a third of beef and dairy that are falling below this carcass weight specification of 280 kilos, but the more worrying one is that confirmation, whereas, and this is actually increasing each year, where there's 15% of our beef and dairy and almost 70% of our dairy dairy falling below this confirmation spec that factories have put in. So I'm going to mainly sp speak on the beef, the beef and the dairy, and I suppose since 2013, we've seen a large increase on the beef uses on the dairy herd, with over 300,000 extra beef on dairy animals coming from the dairy herd since then. It's expected with the increased use of sex semen, improved fertility, there, I suppose, there's going to be no more expansion. This is going to be expected that to be 900,000 beef on of dairy calves coming from the dairy herd in 2032. Exports are an ever-increasing challenge going forward, and I would say we would have to plan for a time where there will be no exports. So the big challenge is who's actually going to rear all these extra calves coming from the dairy herd. And Stuart also said that from 2024, calf slaughterings will also be uh, removed. So looking at calf rears over the last period, and we've seen is that on, on a 42% of farmer, beef farmers that buy uh, calves, uh, so these are calves still on milk, don't worry, 42% of them do only, con uh, that only continue the next year. So there's a big, there's a poor retention of dairy beef farmers in the sector. And it's up to uh, the dairy farmer and a lot of the things that Emer spoke about, improving the health of the calf, but also improving the genetics of the calf to ensure there's more retention of these dairy beef farmers. So firstly is how do we improve the beef usage and or how do we increase the beef usage in the dairy herd? So I suppose always there's a lot of interest and a lot of focus put on the, what dairy bulls we use each year. And there's, we always buy, dairy farmers will always buy more than enough to make sure they'll have enough replacements because that's the main focus. But I suppose if you buy all these dairy straws, you're just going to have extra dairy um, calves and uh, the following year. But to ensure that you have actually used enough beef, you need to calculate how many dairy straws you need. So this is a simple formula to calculate at the start of the year. So the breeding season is just around the corner. Is how do you know how many dairy straws you have? 
So you know how many replacements you will need in the following year, or you'll have a, a rough estimate. So just for example, I'll give an example here, is just say we target 30 heifers for the following year. We have a rough idea what your conception rate is. Some herds will be below and above, but on average, your conception rate for service will be 60%. And you know how many percentage of these will come into females. So the proportion of females will be 50% with conventional semen, but this will be 90% when if you use sex semen. So if you're using conventional semen with a 60% conception rate and you want to have 30 heifers, that's 100 dairy straws that you should be buying and all the rest of the sires and inseminations should be to beef. But if you're using sex semen, obviously you're gonna get a much larger number of dairy females from your sex semen, so you only need to buy 67 dairy, uh, dairy straws in the spring if you're targeting 30 heifers. And again, this can be, the rest of the cows can be inseminated to a beef bull. The other part is, though I suppose a lot of dairy farmers focus all their, their dairy inseminations early in the breeding season. And this is usually your more better cows are gonna come into heat earlier and they're usually the better cows. But there's always cows maybe with a low genetic merit, poor performing cows, cows that we all might, you know, that have mastitis problems or high somatic cell counts or their lameness issues. You don't actually want to breed dairy females off these cows, even though they've come cycling early in the breeding season. There's a potential opportunity to um, use beef at this time as well. So just select your cows at the start of the year. So there's a sire advice system supplied by um, ICBF. So when you're putting in your sire advice, select the cows that you don't want dairy straws on and that will, when you're coming around, it will select a beef bull for these cows. And then finally, I've kind of already mentioned it, is your sex semen. And obviously this is a new technology, a reasonably new technology to a lot of dairy farmers, but it's something that has a great potential to increase the beef on the dairy herd. And, but obviously you have to use this with a lot of caution and ensure that you have good fertility in your herd and try to use it on the more fertile cows and on heifers and also use it early in the breeding season, in the first three weeks, preferably. So then, when you've actually suggested that, so that's kind of how you actually pick your dairy AI and how we increase your beef usage, is now is the selecting of the beef bull. So the dairy beef index has been around now since 2019, and this is, the main concept of this is to select beef sires for the dairy herd. So sires that are easy calving, short gestation, but also to have a good beef merit for the uh, beef farmer that's buying these calves that they will make a, a profitable margin. I, I, I suppose this is actually gonna be updated in 2022 and like the EBI and like all our other breeding objectives with new information, new technology, we're always evolving these and improving them. So in, in January 2022, this now will include an age of slaughter trait and also a carbon sub-index that I'll discuss more now. So I suppose age of slaughter is probably something that we were limiting in our breeding objectives up to now, um, because it is probably a major concern and a lot of talk in the earlier sessions about climate. And age of slaughter is one of the big wins that we can actually do for, uh, to mitigate our, um, um, our climate, um, or mitigate meeting coming from our heart, national herd. So currently, steers are 28 months on average, but we see there's a large variation with some steers coming at 18, 32 months. So there is a large variation with some um, animals actually achieving much earlier age of slaughter. There's an environmental and an economic benefit with age of slaughter. So for your environmental, for every day, uh, for every day younger an animal is at slaughter, that's a less day that animal is actually emitting a methane. And there's also an economic benefit. So there's a less maintenance for each additional day, there's less labor, less facilities, less capital, depreciation, fat, etc. And looking at this, and this obviously your cost of an animal over a lifetime varies throughout the year, but on average, when you take over the whole year, that's coming at a 135 euro a day cost of keeping an animal one day extra. And obviously these costs were done actually before we'll say the recent years, and this has actually increased much more in the increased um, cost of feed in recent years. So 
it is possible to breed for younger age of slaughter. We've with a lot of research over the last couple of years. It is there is a trait there that you can identify animals that are more easily fleshed and that can be slaughtered at a younger age. And this, and although we were something we felt that we were lacking, it's not anywhere in no breeding objective up to now in the world. And this will be the first uh, breeding objective to include age of slaughter. So a lot of the big Concerns with if we breed for age of slaughter, we're just going to reduce carcass weight. And as I said at the start, we actually have a lot of animals falling out of spec for carcass weight. But as we just see here, this is a just a, 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 each dot here represents an active AI bull. And on the left hand axis, we've carcass weight. And on the bottom, we've age of slaughter. And what we can see is there's actually very little relationship between these two traits. There's some bulls good for age some, and, and good for carcass weight, and also some uh, bad for age and bad for carcass weight. But let's just focus on one, uh, we'll say the early maturing breeds. These are your Angus and Herefords, which are most pr prominent in our dairy herd, beef uh, bulls in the dairy herd. And what we can see is at the exact same carcass weight, if you, there's two bulls, there's a 30, age, uh, 30 days of an age of slaughter difference, and at a 135 euro day, this is a 40 euro saving for the beef bull. And he's getting the exact same carcass weight for just using the bull on the left compared to the bull on the right. And a lot of we talk about is, sure, great, I'll just use more Angus and um, Hereford to get my early age of slaughter. But what I just demonstrate here is, and this white dots here, the cream dots, these are actually Belgian blues. So there's actually a wide variation um, as a crossbreed as well as well as within breed and we can see here is that there's some Belgian blues although on average Belgian blues are poor for age of slaughter there is some Belgian blues still as nearly as good as your Angus um, here for age of slaughter and the other part the other big addition to the, D, the dairy beef index is your carbon sub index so we expect that in the future years that there's going to be a cost in farmers for the carbon they produce there's already talks in New Zealand that they're bringing this in in the coming years. And breeding is not for tomorrow, it's, for the gener it's coming for the years ahead. So we need to be ahead of this in our breeding um, objectives. So we've included carbon at a cost of 80 euro a ton. So just to compare what this carbon summit index is doing. So what for economically, we have shorter gestation is beneficial, younger age of slaughter is beneficial, and a heavier carcass weight is all economically beneficial. These are three traits in our carbon sum index. And again, when we improve shorter gestation, we're improving the environmental because less, less uh, days carried, there are earlier calving and uh, cows are calving in the breeding season. This is a, an environmental benefit. Younger age of slaughter, as I already said, this is also an environmental benefit. Although there will be a negative weighting on carcass weight in our carbon sub index because for every a heavier animal emits more carbon, so this is going to be accounted for within our carbon sub index, so there'll be actually a negative cost here within our carbon sub index, but there'll still be an economic uh, benefit in the rest of the breeding objective. So just to summarize on the dairy beef index, and overall what we're trying to do is to improve carcass weight or beef traits while also uh, keeping low calving difficulty. So here, your green dots here are your, your bulls that are good for dairy beef index. They're on your le top left. So they're the ones that are easy calving and good for carcass weight. And as we can see in future years, these, there'll be more bulls coming into this top left as we improve our breeding program. And be, the cloud will move into that top le left-hand corner. So there'll actually be more bulls available with better calving, uh, with easier calving and better carcass weight. So the commercial beef value, and maybe this is more for a beef farmer, but it's actually what's actually going to drive calves this spring. Is this is what animals actually are? This is the genetic merit for beef traits of an animal after they're born. So what's their potential to a dairy beef farmer? So it's the exact same as our dairy beef index, but we've removed the calving traits because these are, there's no need for these for a non-breeding animal. So it's going to be the, the CBV or the commercial beef value. So you're just including your beef traits as well as your carbon sub index. 
And, and most important, and this is going to be available on your ICBF reports, and beef farmers can use this tool to select their calves that they will buy and the value they'll put on these calves. So I said that we're going to try to increase, increase the beef usage to improve the quality of the calves coming from the dairy herd. But that's not always the case. That just using a beef bull does not mean we're going to get a better beef calf. Here is the, actually the distribution of the commercial beef value. So what we predict these animals as a beef value of the animals up in grains in the dairy beef trial. So the Angus is here are their light green bars and the Frisian here are the black bars. And what we can see is there's some Angus is really bad for the commercial beef value but, and also ang and as well as Frisians. But there's also some Frisians much better than your Angus sired animals based on this commercial beef value. But these are the animals, and the, top, and the right here are these graphs, these animals that are high commercial beef value, these animals are going to have a higher carcass value and are going to be more valuable to the beef farmer. These are the animals that the dairy farmer will need to produce to have a sale of a calf going forward. So just looking at beef, how does this actually work and using beef sires to actually breed these high commercial beef value calves. So here I just took a cow with a reasonably average EBI of 147 and an average, a relatively national average of minus 7 on beef sub -ethnics. I just looked at if we used a bull of a DBI of 60 euro with a beef sub -index value of 25 euro with very easy calving, this calf will give, have a CBV value of 44 euro. But on the other hand, with a bull that's a very similar calving difficulty of 2.7%, with a much higher DBI, and this, a lot of this is coming from your beef sub index of 107 euro, you're actually with eggs, using this bull and that cow, you're actually going to get a calf with a CBV of 132 euro. So this calf is much more valuable to the beef farmer going forward. And this is just a little table to maybe where dairy farmers need to focus their beef bulls. So I said we need to use DBI, but Within the DBI, it's broken up into two sub-index. There's your calving sub-index and your beef sub-index. And we need to really drive that beef side and maybe try to pick bulls that are high in that beef side so they're balanced both for calving and beef. So here, I just broke it down into herds, maybe our cows, that we had a very low beef sub-index within the DBI. They should be trying to target the real good bulls for beef beef merit. So they want to be using a bull of over 80 euro on the beef sub-index to achieve a really good CBV value of over 80 euro, which this would put it in the top 40% of uh, dairy beef calves. And as you see, as your beef sub-index of your cows um, improve, your beef bull doesn't have to be as good, but again, the better your beef bull, the more value your calf is going to be. So does this actually work? I, I've said here that there's going to, this CBV is potential and has, what's actually leading for the dairy beef farmers? So I just follow, you just followed these two calves and one was a, there was a 28 kilo carcass difference between these two calves. So the higher CBV value calf was 28 kilos heavier carcass, had higher conformation, so more muscles, more high value cuts, was slightly lower uh, fat score, and at the factory was paid 142 euro more. Now, unfortunately, although we are trying to improve age of slaughter, the animal with higher CBV did was slaughtered older by 12 days, which this actually was a cost on the beef farm of an extra 56 euro. But overall, when we take in the whole system, this animal with a CBV of 132 euro versus that lower CBV value of 44 euro, there was an 86 euro difference between the two actually on the ground. And just looking here, we actually predicted 88 euro, but we actually saw 86. So this was actually very close to the prediction. So to summarize, there is a large number of dairy beef calves coming and we need to find homes for these calves. We need rarers for these calves. So following on from our Emer, we need to do a lot of those, make sure these are healthy calves and also have a high beef merit. So when these beef farmers take these calves, they can make a margin from these calves and be profitable. 
Tools such as the dairy beef index and the commercial beef value will really help in this. So your dairy beef index is for a dairy farmer to pick the beef bull that's easy calving with good beef merit, but the commercial beef value then is for that dairy beef farmer to buy his calves. So this will be a tool that will dr drive the demand of uh, dairy beef calves. And it's up to the dairy farmer to control what beef genetics dairy beef farms have. So it's the breeding season, as when the dairy farmer selects his beef bulls, it's up to, it's at that stage is determining the dairy beef uh, farmer's uh, profit going forward. So the better beef bulls that the dairy farmers use, the more saleable his calves will be. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ellen. So I might just ask you to take a seat here, Ellen, and I'll ask Eimear to come up and Liam Long as well. So I'm just going to show you a video um, of Liam Long's farm. So Liam is farming since 2013. He trained as an electrician originally and came home to join his brother Mike and his father Michael at home and their farm just outside of Ardfinnan. And they would have originally had dairy, beef, and tillage. Uh, and then when Liam came back, and obviously with quarters going in 2015, they decided to change around the enterprise mix and they've pushed up in the cow numbers, but they also still have a bit of beef. So their brother Richard is also uh, one of the dairy beef 500 farms. Um, so there's obviously an emphasis in terms of beef on the farm. So we're just, we've just used Liam as an example of a farmer who's putting into practice basically what Alan has just been talking about, okay? My name is Liam Long, and I farm here with my father Michael and my brother Mike just outside Ardfinnan in County Tipperary. Uh, we are currently milking 220 cows and keep some beef to finish. Uh, we are a spring calving herd and calf in excess of 80% in six weeks. We are producing approximately 460 kilos of milk solids supplying dairy gold co-op. In the past, breeding on the farm was done with stock bulls, but it has changed to all dairy AI for replacements and beef AI plus Angus stock bulls towards the end of the breeding season. For us, breeding the best beef animal we can without affecting the dairy herd is our main objective. We use Limousine, Hereford, Charley and Aubrac Beef AI. We found the Charley and Limousine tend to carry time, so we're considering moving away from them in the future. It's not that there's any difference in calving, but the gestation length would be a concern we have. All calves are fed colostrum and fed whole milk to weaning. We are a bit tight on calf housing here on the farm, but hope to build a new calf house within the next two years. We vaccinate for lepto, IBR, and salmonella in the herd, and the calves are done for RSV PI3. Also, we're starting rotavirus this year as a precaution, as we don't want any problems in the springtime. Uh, with the type of beef calves we have, even though our brother Richard takes 100 of them currently, I know we would have no issue selling them if he decided to cut back as they are good quality calves. And as I said already, our main aim is to breed the best beef animal we can without affecting the performance of our own dairy herd. So Liam, I just put a few questions to you there um, just before we open it up to the floor. You said there that you focus on, um, we say that your objective is to breed the best beef animal that you can, but in terms of the actual dairy herd, what's the, like, you still focus on that as well, and uh, again, I suppose, when you came back in 13, you, you're doing your own AI now as well. How, what, what's, the, what's the objective with the dairy herd in the first place? Um, the number one trait we'd kind of go for would be fertility. We'd be very heavily weighted on that all along. Um, we are, our milk sub in index is low enough in the EBI, so we are, in the next couple of years, we'll push more for that um, bulls that are bringing more milk into the herd. Um, but we're trying to, yeah, try and keep a, a nice shaped cow as well, um, trying to breed as close to a dual purpose animal as we can going forward. But at the same time, your focus is on the black and white all along anyway. Oh yeah, yeah, and like going forward, the milk is our number one, like the, the beef is grand and all, but Really and truly, the, it's a byproduct of the dairy, dairy cows. So the, we we keep our main target on the milk. Okay, so I suppose <coughs> you, you mentioned it as a byproduct there now, but in, in from your own perspective on the farm, your objective is still to breed good quality stock for yourselves 
and also for Richard, obviously, as he's there. Have you concerns around the calving side of things? No, you're it has to be said that your calf mortality figures, Emer mentioned them in her presentation, your calf mortality figures are off the charts in terms of excellent, like less than 0.6% average over three years. So low date at birth and at the 28 days, which is the industry objective there that Emer's talking about, you obviously have very good attention to detail around calving, but is that beef element uh, a concern for you, we'll say, in terms of calving difficulty? Uh, no. Um Myself and Mike, we'd put an awful lot of effort into calf and the cows. Um, we'd watch them and give them a hand as much as we can. Um, I suppose because we try to be there all the time ourselves, we're not too concerned if a big calf is coming, if it needs assistance, we're there to do it. And so um, calf and difficulty, some of the even Belgian blue bulls and the Charlies have been up around 7 and 8, even 9 percent, I think, one of them. Um, probably wouldn't want to be going too much that way. Um, but no, it's not a major concern. I suppose one of the other points that you made to me when we were preparing for this is that the, one of the hardest pulls of a calf you ever had was actually a Frisian bull. Yeah, it was a fair challenge, yeah. But I suppose even everyone probably here has seen at different times, you could inseminate two cows the same day with the same bull and they could calf maybe seven days apart. So that's going to have a, an impact on the size of the calf then that comes like so. I suppose it's not always down to the bull either, like the cow can throw up some of the challenges as well. Yeah, okay. So just uh, the final question before we throw it open to the floor, I suppose, is um, like just from your involvement, albeit indirectly with Richard and the Dairy B500, so there's obviously Richard has some influence in terms of the genetics that you're using. How do you choose the bulls that you're using and how do you plan to choose them? Are, are you going to change some of the, the, the criteria that you're using in the hope of maybe getting beefier animals for, for the beef side of the enterprise that you have without the risk of any issues around calving? Yeah, I suppose we've, the last two years we've um, tried a couple of flick phase now. So hopefully we'll see another couple of years uh, what way they're going to come through in the herd. Um, breeding is always a slow thing. It takes years as you know yourself, just to see the results. But um, we had a very good relationship with Joe Tobin, our Munster AI rep all along. And now with Graham Swanson going forward, hopefully we'll be able to build on that. And we rely on them a lot too for picking the bulls and keeping us up to date with what's coming. So you're just engaging with your breeding company basically to make sure that you get what you're looking for in terms of the beef side of things without the risk of, of the, the calving side of things. So one of the other points that I would have picked up from you as well talking to you is that there's a high emphasis on the reliability of that calving figure that you are using, that, to, that if it is the 5%, that there's a fairly high confidence level in that 5% five, 5 figure like? Yeah, like sure, we do, we do depend on the expertise of the, the AI companies and the, all the data that the ICBF and I'll bring to, to the table, so we hope that, we, same as everyone here, that, that that is reliable. Yeah, okay. So Alan, just before I do uh, throw it open to the floor there, just uh, on the slides that you showed there in terms of the progression over the next number of years, there's a small bit of a, a chicken and an egg scenario here, isn't there, with the beef. So, as I said, the beef has kind of been focused on the beefing characteristics all along, really. Uh, and you mentioned the figure there in relation to that CBV figure of trying to target greater than 50 euro for the beef sub-index. And I was looking at the DBI there, and there's up to 170 bulls available that are in excess of that figure. So the choice is there in terms of the beefing characteristics. But obviously, as you said in your presentation as well, concern is around the calving side of things and Liam has spoken a little bit about it there as well. Is there scope to actually select for the, the we'll say the Belgian blue we'll say that you picked out in the in the slides that you're talking there that we can over the next number of years drive towards that that animal that's going to calve easy but going to beef up then as they grow uh, and how quickly can we hope to do that and I suppose the other side of it is that we, in the in the beef scenario if we only get one good bull Obviously, we can keep using that bull for a number of years, which is different to the dairy scenario where we end up with rela relations and so forth and causing problems with crossbreeding. Um, uh, you, so to actually to achieve that really, to make improvement in the dairy beef index, it'll actually be led by demand. So it would have been similar with the EBI. When the EBI was first came out, I suppose there was a lot of hesitation. AI companies were hesitant to use it. And until the dairy farmer went, I want the highest EBI possible, it was until then 
It was, a, it was the AI companies went out and strived to get the extremely best DBI bulls they could get. And it'll be the exact same here. If they, at the moment, if they can sell the easy calving bulls with a very poor beef merit, they're going to continue to sell them. But it's up to the dairy farmer to actually strive for these improved dairy beef bulls. The more they demand from, the more the AI companies are going to go out to the breeders and the industry and try to actually pick these extreme outliers. And there, that's how genetic progress will build between calving and your, calv and your carcass uh, trip. Okay, and Emer, I suppose, just to come to you now, um, we'll say if there's one piece of advice, and uh, you gave several indications there on the last slide, what's the one thing that you should say, or that you would say that every dairy farmer in the room needs to make sure they have for next spring? Um, can I give you two? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the first one is down to the calf. So we'll say colostrum because, like, aside from this, we did a small survey of, of some dairy beef farmers and we asked them what are they looking for. And one of the things they said was that they're going to ask the dairy farmer, you know, has the calf received colostrum? Has it received enough colostrum? And the biggest thing that they're looking for when it came to sourcing a calf was a good, strong, healthy calf. And that's only going to happen if you have, like, you know... Um, I guess, calves that, that are healthy, that have gotten their classroom. But aside from that, then, the space allowance of the calves. Just if, if you were to go out and just measure your sheds and make sure they have enough space for, for all the calves that are, that are going to be born. Um, and if you don't, try to come up with some, some kind of alternative plan or ac accommodation for them. There might be other sheds that you convert, can convert um, to use. But just be prepared is the biggest thing. Uh, and you said actually that I think it was the Sweeney study as well where you were doing the survey that there was a lot of farmers that identified sheds that they were going to use potentially in advance of calving. But when you went back during calving, they actually hadn't engaged those facilities yeah. at all. So, yeah, it was with um, Alison, Alison uh, Sinnott, so she did, did a survey. Um, and when we went out to the farms, we went, like, say, at this time of year to be ready for the calving season. That we, so we would have measured out all the, the calf sheds. Um, and when we went back in spring, a lot of the calf sheds that they had identified weren't actually in use. But what that showed us was that they were thinking ahead, that you know, they, they, they were getting the space ready for, or knew where they were going to put calves if there was um, a bit of overcrowding going on. Okay, so I'll take two or three questions from the floor, because Joe has given me the, the, the thumbs up that I need to be finishing up quickly <laughs> to get onto the next session. So anybody have any questions for any of the three people here? Brendan's over here on the left of the mic. There's one there, John Mack. There's, oh, sorry, Sean. Fergal will pass in the microphone there, too. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> action, action. Will I go? I, I, I'm a beef farmer that came into this conference looking for free calves. <laughs> <laughs> I have the cow box outside. But the real question I'm asking is, how, if I'm going to buy calves in spring and I'm interested in this CBV, how am I going to know what the CBV of my calf is that I'm buying in the mart? Alan, I'll put that one to you. Okay. Um, so I know you said the mart, but I suppose firstly, if you are buying directly with CBV, dairy farmers will have availability, have access to the CBV of all their calves. They actually have the access to the CBV of their calves that are expected to be born, so they can actually supply that now. So they can print that down and give it to the beef farmer that's interested in the calves of the CBV. For the marts, obviously there was a, there's a concern over the actually correct parentage, and if it's an incorrect parentage, then the CBV will be wrong, and they'll would farmers would lose confidence in the CBV. So we, it needed to be ensured that the correct parentage of the calves were for CBV going through the mart. And only genotype calves are going to have a CBV in the mart. So it will be available in mart boards, but only for genotype calves. Okay, Sean. Yeah, just a quick question there in relation to the EBI. The, we'll say the new EBI that's come out there now, it has put a... The, the carbon index side of it, right? The, the highest, the 10 highest carbon bulls or the most carbon efficient bulls are all perhaps um, jerseys or, or, or something close to jerseys anyway. But at the same time, they, they have a very, they probably hit very low on the beef, beef value side of things. Now, so much so that they're not going to hit the 280 kilo carcass weights that's required. Now, while it's desirable to get to the 280 kilo carcass weights, and we, we can all see where we need to go, 
do those, should those cows at the moment, who are highly carbon efficient, but perhaps breeding calves that are, even with the high DBI bulls, that are not going to hit that, should there be a massive U-turn done with those cows, and it was, or, should, or, or what should be done with them as a breeding policy going forward? So again, that's for you, Alan. I suppose the comment on, we'll say, should we be, what you're saying, Sean, is should we be trying to improve the beef element of the, the dairy cow? No, should, should we be trying to, how will I say, completely turn around the Jersey element of, of the, the high bulls, which, which will negate the carbon side of things then, but in order to try and make the calf saleable for the want of a better way of putting it. Okay. okay. So, okay, so you spoke about the top bulls and the carbon summonics, and I suppose the carbon summonics in the EBI is only a part of the overall EBI. So those bulls might naturally come up very high in the EBI because it's only a part of it, it's only a certain weighting. So again, that'll be a lot of breeding and what AI companies will get that balanced EBI bulls that are good for that, them carbon traits, good for beef, and also good for the other traits such as fertility and milk production. So, and also we actually, in that, the beef sub index was updated within the EBI, so there's going to be a counteract some of those concerns we have, and a lot of that is there's a really high penalty on those low carcass bulls, so there's a negative bulls, dairy bulls that produce very low carcass weight, there's a high penalty on those. So there's a non-linear as the weaker the carcasses, the higher the penalty on them. So it will penalize those really bull, bad bull, them bulls, bad for uh, beef. So that will, con that will come into the overall EBI. So it's kind of a balancing act between the two. That's really only if they have a dairy bred calf, though, Sean. I think, Alan, your point is that if you use the high DBI bull with the hefty weighting on your beef sub-index, Sean, you can still turn them into suitable animals for the beef trade. Okay. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to add on to that. Yeah, so, and I kind of said that, those bulls, that are, there's cows that are really bad for beef sub-merit. It's up to the dairy farmer now to really, they have to really focus on the beef merit of the bull. And I can see where you're coming from is, the beef bull can only take us so far, well, we, there is bulls out there, but they're just not using them. We need to get those beef bulls used. And I, I know we're, and I'm, in, I'm involved with projects with, in herds and in crossbred herds, and they've been using these high dairy beef index bulls. And a lot of the data coming from them is you can achieve good quality carcasses if the right bull is using these. But again, sex semen should be used in those very poor beef mare as well. And I suppose it's important to point out that the CBV is going to gain traction over time as well, Sean, that will say farmers will see the value in it, even if, there, even if there is JEX coming up on the board, if they can see that the CBV is strong, they're going to be able to follow through with them. So if, look, if we've no further questions, I suppose we'll uh, wrap it at that, as I said, in the interest of trying to make up time. So Joe is just coming forward there to start session four. I'd just like to thank very much all people involved in this session. So Alan, Emer, Liam Long, and also Liam Roach for his time for making the video uh, that was included in Emer's presentation. I'd just like you to show your appreciation for the speakers, please. Thank you.